Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the technical session TS5 for of medical and bio, uh, medical and biomedical imaging. My name is Leandro Fernandes, and it's a pleasure for me to be the chair of the session. Well, uh, today uh, short videos of four works will be presented. Each video is up to five minutes long. Uh, and followed by a five-minute session of questions and answers. Ask your questions via the Wovo app or text chat on YouTube, okay? Um, I will read your questions to the authors and they will answer them uh, live. Uh, the first work uh, in the session uh, has the title Automatic Classification of Eritrocytes Using Artificial Neural Networks and Integral Geometry Basic Functions. It will be presented by Yama Passotto from Universidad de Guantanamo in Cuba. Automatic Classification of Eritrocytes Using Artificial Neural Networks and Integral Geometry Basic Functions. Second cell anemia is a hemoglobinopathy that causes the formation of red blood cells with loss elasticity and a twilight cycle or crescent appearance. Red blood cell deformation and rigidity can cause vascular obstructions, generating intense crisis of pain in the joint and even heart attacks. The clinical fallout of persons affected with second cell anemia consists of carrying out complementary tests, which include observing peripheral blood samples under a microscope to obtain a criterion about the deformation of the red blood cells. This process is with conversion, error-prone, and time-consuming, but can be supported by automatic techniques that allow red blood cells to be classified according to the change they present. In the classifying erythrocytes, according to their shape, exist proposals that use functions based on integral geometry to obtain a description of the cell's contour before performing classification. In those approaches, the classification confusion case persists, mainly in the classes of most significant interest, which are those related to the detection of deformed cells. In this work, the main contribution is the use of artificial neural networks trained with features obtained using integral geometry-based functions to perform the morphological analysis and classification of red blood cell. In this paper, we have considered the greater integrated generalized support function, Crofton descriptors, and three computationally efficient variants as input data to the ANA-based classifier. The workflow of the proposed approach consists of the following steps. Number one, to obtain the contour of previously segmented erythrocytes. Number two, to obtain the representation of the shape of erythrocyte as integral geometry-based feature vectors. And number three, to perform erythrocyte supervised classification by training and evaluating artificial neural network models with the characteristics obtained in the second step. The conclusions of this work are the following. Our proposal achieved accuracy of 98.40%. This result is superior to those of previous studies concerning the classes of greatest interest. Our approach is computationally more efficient than previous works, making it suitable for supporting medical follow-up diagnosis of cycle cell disease. Well, uh, unfortunately, Aima could not be here with us today uh, due to some uh, international, uh, some um, internet connection issues that she is facing. So I will answer the questions uh, because uh, I'm one of the, the co-authors of this paper. Um, I 
just check it the WOVA app and don't you know, I don't see any questions from there. Please, if you are in the audience and have uh, some uh, they have a question, please send in the chat uh, uh, on YouTube. Okay, there is a small delay, so I will wait. I will wait uh, one minute to see if any questions come up in YouTube. Okay. Maybe one minute is too long. Well, I'm one of co-authors, so I'm afraid that, that I have no questions, <laughs> right? Uh, let's move on to the next presentation. Um, the next speaker is Bernardo Silva from the Universidade Federal da Bahia. He will present the paper entitled I study on tooth segmentation and numbering using end-to-end -end deep neural networks. Hello everyone. My colleagues from iVision Lab and I are inviting you all to the presentation of our CV Graphy 2020 work a study on tooth segmentation and numbering using end-to-end -end deep neural networks. But firstly, let me briefly talk about X-ray images in dentistry. There are several types of dental X-rays, being the most common ones, the between, the panoramic and the periopical types. Our study focused on the panoramic type, which is the most challenging one to interpret. We aim to segment a number tooth instance through end-to-end -end deep neural networks to perform automatic analysis and form filling. However, some of you may be wondering, what is tooth numbering? Well, dentists frequently refer to teeth in their daily routine, but designating teeth by their full name is tedious and inefficient. As a consequence, many dental notation systems came out to expedite communication and form feelings. The most common dental notation system is the FDI World Dental Federation notation. This notation identifies each permanent tooth by a two-digit number. The first digit specifies the quadrant, and the second digit, the tooth type. In the literature, we find some works that perform segmentation, detection, or numbering on panoramic dental X-rays. However, no work performs all these tasks at once, being ours the first one. We conducted the study by means of a benchmark, where all the selected networks extend the two state detectors and reach the state-of-the-art performance in the instant segmentation task on the COGO dataset. The networks were Mask RCNN by He et al., Path Aggregation Network or PANET for short by Liu et al., Hybrid Test Cascade or HTC by Chen et al., and Split Attention Network, also known as ResNest by Jung et al. After we performed our experiments, we came to the results, and the quantitative ones are in the following tables. The PANET had the best performance in all evaluation metrics on the test dataset. We also did a supplementary evaluation, a semantic segmentation one, on more than 700 images. Here, PNET won in all metrics, except for the recall by a small margin. We compared these extra results with the ones from Jada et al. In this comparison, all architectures from the benchmark outperformed the solution by Jada et al. in the F1 score and in the accuracy. However, we do consider that it wasn't a perfectly symmetric comparison. The qualitative results are quite impressive. Here is the best outcome from the PANET on the test dataset. The worst result is also quite good. In this case, the bad metric is due to a comparison with crude annotations. Let's compare all the best results side by side. 
one more time. All results are very satisfactory. And now let's compare all the worst results. One more time. Even the worst results are quite good, with only a few missing instances. Our experiment's results allowed us to conclude that detecting, numbering, and segmenting teeth on panoramic dental X-ray image is entirely feasible using end-to-end -end deep neural networks. The choice of the neural network architecture, however, has a significant impact on the overall performance. And the PANET had the best performance in our experiments. Thanks for watching, and we are looking forward to seeing you all on the live Q&A section. Well, uh, thank you, Bernardo, for for your presentation. Now uh, we we will open to the audience to make uh, uh, the, the questions. Okay, um, I'm monitoring the Wova app, uh, and so far I don't see any question. Uh, maybe uh, I should make my own questions, and then in the this, in the middle of time, the audience can send more questions to you. Okay. Uh, so the first question I have is this. Um, in, in this work, uh, you apply recent deep learning architectures to perform the segmentation and counting of teeth, right? As a result, the performance comparison of these architectures is presented, which is undoubtedly a result of interest to our scientific community. Uh, but the comparison with previous techniques under the same conditions, in the same conditions, I mean, uh, using the same data set, uh, and so on, has not been carried out. Uh, the question is, uh, why? Uh, okay. Um, I think that's a good question, and uh, there were some reasons why we didn't carry out a comparison with other works with the same data set. And I think different from, uh, I don't know, uh, smart series applications, the data sets are not public. So every paper has its own data set. So we already did a benchmark, which included four neural network architectures. So these architect, uh, and that's why, that's why, that's what already a lot of work. So uh, we had to do a symmetric comparison between all these, uh, these architectures and uh this uh, we thought that it was already a uh, good enough results to be published but we are in the future considering to to establish uh, uh another benchmark with different uh how can i say it with different uh, uh techniques published by other authors and uh and that's why we release our our, our data set because we want to other authors to use our data set with and can compare with the same conditions. But there are a lot of uh, issues of uh, metrics and I don't know, codes and hyperparameters that make this test very difficult. So that's why we didn't uh, carry out uh, uh, carry out a comparison among other uh, with other works. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and also, uh, sometimes the code uh, from other authors is not available, uh, and that yeah. also, also is a difficult uh, to a, a difficulty to be uh, handled, right? Um, my other question is that according to the comparison protocol, uh, wherever possible, the same parameters and hyperparameters were applied to the networks. However, this does not guarantee that each network will reach the best possible model in training. Uh, did you consider using techniques like hyperband and other approaches to optimize the choice of hyperparameters that best suits each solution? Okay, I, I'm not uh, familiar with this technique like hyperband, but what we did to 
to solve this issue that you mentioned is that we chose a, a small learning rate. So we thought that with a small learning rate and conducting the training with no time concern, uh, this this issue that you mentioned would be would be uh, I don't know mitigated at least. So um, in this in this sense, I think that uh, we did a benchmark that was that was at least uh, fair enough to each uh, to each architecture. So our conclusions, I think, are solid. Oh, oh yes, your conclusions, uh, it seems solid, uh, right? I'm not questioning that okay. this. Okay. <laughs> so we did your no, no, no. Uh, uh, no, just... I, I, I mean, okay. I mean that uh, I understand your point uh, because we we mentioned that in the paper that we wanted to uh, make the most of each uh, each net neural network architecture, but um, when you do a benchmark, that is not all, always possible to make the best of each neural network architecture and make the same uh, uh, apply the same hyperparameters. Uh, mm -hmm. As as I said, I'm not familiar with the hyperband technique or these other approach, but uh, I will research and I will thank for the, I, will, I I I thank you for the the suggestion and I'm not. Uh, at all saying that you implied that. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Okay. So, okay. Sorry if it was a misunderstanding. No, 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 uh, no, no, was, no, no don't worry yeah. about it. Uh, just one, one more comment. Uh, it's not a question, okay? Uh, I really like it, uh, the directions for future work presented in, in your paper. Uh, I think that these directions will certainly help other researchers to who intend to seek solutions for this problem. Uh, I think that those directions are a good uh, a good guide guide for uh, uh, yes. about and where by to the way, we are yeah so and sometimes the way, the, we, are, we are tackling some of these problems already so <laughs> maybe. Uh, sometimes those directions are too loose you know uh, yeah, and I, I think that the way you put there uh, were great uh, it, it's clear the path that uh, one can uh, seek to to solve a super okay. problem of this problem. So con congratulations. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Leon. Uh, well, uh, I don't see any question for the audience in the app or in uh, in the chat at uh, YouTube. Uh, so let's move to the next paper. Okay. Uh, so this section's next work is capturing pictures from human vision using SSVAP and locking amplifi sorry, amplifier. Uh, it will be presented by Denson Evan Garcia from the University of Toronto. Hi everyone, this is Danson and we are presenting the paper Capturing Pictures from Human Vision using SSVP and Locket Amplifier for this year's SIDRAP conference. For the brief overview, we will provide some background and introduction, then discuss the methods and results. Lastly, we will conclude the findings and explore some potential future direction. Metavalence is the sensing of sensing. Through understanding and visualization of the senses, we may improve our understanding of the perception of both humans and machines and their respective capabilities. Neuroimaging devices can provide strong entry points of study for metavalence applied to humans. To ensure that our project is easily accessible, we have designed our experiments to operate on a low cost wearable five channel EEG device. SSVEP response patterns are periodic responses from the visual cortex that are evoked through a visual stimulus flickering at specific frequencies. This response is characterized by an increase in neural activity at the same frequency of the visual stimulus. In common practice, SSVEP signals are usually monitored using EEG or fMRI and are detected from a large range of frequencies. However, human brains show steady and strong responses only in a limited range of stimulus frequencies. The MUSE meditation headband by Interaxon is the EEG sensing device used during the experiments. An electrode is added and placed at the OZ position following the 1020 system, since that position is the most consistent for measuring SSVP responses at varying frequencies. 
First, new participants perform a five-minute frequency detection task using a flickering stimulus to discover their optimal SSVEP response frequency, as shown on the left. The target black and white image is then selected and sliced into sub-images of equal frame size, as shown on the right. Finally, we run the core experiment to collect EEG data using the MUSE and the algorithms. FFT is one of the algorithms used in the experiment. The algorithm transforms a signal from its original time domain representation to components in the frequency domain. Activation of SSVP are often located in a triangle of activation surrounding the target frequency as shown in the figure. Therefore, we take all the activations in a range around the target value to form the bitmap value. Additionally, we implemented two lock and amplifier algorithms to extract the original signal. The method on the left uses Raman integral to find the signal magnitude. The raw EEG is multiplied by the reference wave then integrated over n points where n is the total number of points sampled over the given stimulus duration. The method on the right uses a digital low pass filter mirroring how a hardware based uh, lock and amplifier works. Raw EEG data is first multiplied by the reference wave and its 90 degree phase shifted counterpart at the target frequency for each pixel frame. Then a second order Butterworth filter at 0.7 Hertz is applied to modify the signal. Displayed here are some of the image reconstruction results using RI as a camera with SSVP. First, an image of a tree with many leaves, giving it great geometric complexity. And second, a black and white image of a human face. The majority of the features were recovered using the three algorithm techniques described earlier, with low pass LIA performing with the best quality and consistency. In conclusion, with the methods and algorithms, multiple participants are able to take high definition photographs of multi-featured and complex objects such as the human face. Possible future direction include cognitive studies and visual acuity, multicolored image capture, and image reconstruction enhancements. This ends the highlights of our work. Good morning. Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, so, uh, Dawson, Ivan Garcia, and Kai Wenzeng are here to answer the questions from the audience. Uh, well, well, we have a, a small, not, not a small, but a big delay from the questions that may, may have been made uh, in the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, so please, the audience should uh, send the questions via the WUVA app, all right? Um, but before moving on the questions, I would like to congratulate you to, uh, on your work. It looks like science fiction. Oh, <laughs> thank you, yeah. It? Okay, and in fact, there's no way to be more computer vision than that, okay? <laughs> it's it's nice. amazing. Thank you, um, oh, excellent. <laughs> So, my first question is: um, Which you, which do you consider the biggest limiter for the results obtained so far? The EEG technology, the algorithms, or there is any other factor that requires researchers' attention uh, in the next years? Um, so I'd say it's a com it's a it's it's a combination because. Um, right now, what we're working on the most is to reduce the noise that's coming from the signal itself. Um, because as you can see, uh, there's quite a bit of speckle noise in the pictures that we've been taking. Um, we're really happy with the fact that we got most of the features back when we're taking the pictures. So, so yeah, that's, uh, and noise is mostly coming from um, the device and as well as, well as like biological influences. So, uh that's probably what i would say is the limiting factor right now okay and another question i think thank you for for your answer and another question is uh, some eeg technologies uh to use at home uh uh the user gets tired when using you know you mm -hmm. know th those ones that uh you move the mouse around and so on <laughs> uh, uh and in this case the user also has to train uh, himself to 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 use the device and and uh, and 
make a, a better uh, get better results from the the algorithm, or mm -hmm. no, it's uh, a simpler or less uh, uh, depends less on the user. So there's definitely um, steps that the user has to go through to both put on the device and uh, to go through the techniques that we use. So the, fa the fact that visual attention really like influences the end results means that for sure, like the user needs to be focused and alert and then actually um, looking at the experiment as it runs when there's a flickering stimulus on the screen. Um, as well as the fact that the external electrode that uh, we put at the back of the head to measure the actual SSVP response, that needs to be tightly uh, tightly placed um, against the occipital lobe. Otherwise, you're going to get like uh, noise from the air, noise from like electrical uh, appliances around the, the house. So yeah. Um, so just to add on to what uh, Kai Wen said, uh, basically like that's where we're trying to mitigate the fact that um, if if the user doesn't have like, for example, the right frequency, um, you know, like that's why we have like the initial step where we try to find uh, the most comfortable or the best frequency to record things so that we don't have to redo it from scratch. Uh, and then also, uh, as you can tell from our uh, experimental results, we did look into stimulus duration as well. So we wanna make sure that we get um, the smallest, uh, time stimulus time duration that will permit us to recapture back an image and it's a it's a really good uh, cognitive exercise too to to make sure that um to pretty much like capture uh, whatever your eye sees right so okay uh, th th thank you uh, again for, for your answers uh, i don't see any question for the audience maybe because we have a a, a huge delay in the presentation of this session uh, at YouTube. And so maybe you, you will uh, receive some uh, some questions uh, in the UVA app in the next minutes, OK? Don't Perfect, so, uh, yeah. To the audience, please make your questions that the authors will answer you your questions uh, via the app, OK? Uh, thank you again for your talk, and congratulations uh, for your work. Thank you, Leandro. Thanks. Well, and now, uh, Carl Eduardo from the University of Campinas will present the paper Detecting Alzheimer's Disease Based on Structural Region Analysis Using uh, a 3D Shape Descriptor. Hi, everyone. My name is Kawe, and I'm one of the authors of the work entitled Detecting Alzheimer's Disease Based on structural region analysis using a 3D shape description. This work was elaborated in collaboration of the University of Campinas and the University of Calgary. So the main idea of this work is to understand how the shapes of each anatomical brain region changes while the Alzheimer progresses. So a quick overview about Alzheimer's provided by the Alzheimer's Association is that is a type of dementia that causes problems related to memory, thinking, behavior, and not only that, because those changes also affect the change uh, your body behavior. So right here we show two examples. The one MRI on the left show a patient with no dementia detected and the one MRI on the right shows a patient with seven years of dementia. And as we can see here, the right hemisphere is drastically affected by the dementia, uh, both in cortex and in the deep inner gray matter. So the main topics of this work is first, uh, state a shape description that analyze every region in the brain. And also because we know that as long as any disease progresses, the shape is going to change. So understanding the, uh, the full volume is going to allow us to detect or even in the future predict. 
So there are different ways to perform and identify Alzheimer's. So the one we use in this work was by using imaging and most specifically uh, using magnet resonance imaging or MRI. So our main contribution in this work is to provide a scale invariant Hitch kernel signature that identify different structures in the brain. Why we chose this approach? First, because it's scale invariant. This means that for us, we know that the brain, uh, the scale of the brain is not important because every patient has a different size, different brain size. And this doesn't mean that the patient has dementia or not. And also because this shape descriptor can be applied in a 3D representation of the brain. I'm not going to get, get into detail in each one of our steps, but just a quick overview. In the data acquisition and selection, we declare how uh, we get our images and also how we select the best scans for each patient. But just a spoiler about it, uh, we use a patient volume selection that is a software that we developed. The second step is related to the segmentation of the brain, so how we obtain each one of the brain regions. So one, we use for this step the free surfer tool. And after that, we uh, created a mesh for each region. And once we have the mesh, we are going to calculate our third step that is related to our main contribution. So right here, we have the feature extraction approach. So we have different uh, frequencies of the descriptor, but after we clustering, we can calculate the similarity among all the patients. And our hypothesis is Patients inside the same class or a same stage of the mild cognitive impairment uh, presents higher correlation, higher covariance, and and patients in different classes are going to present uh, low covariance. So to understand better how the similarity works and also uh, detail more about the steps just come to our section and see our full presentation. So thank you all for your attention and I see you there. Hi, Lindo. Uh, hi, Kawe, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so I will move on to my own questions because we have this huge delay and maybe you you, you uh, receive on the, another questions for the audience in the next minutes, okay? Okay. Uh, so uh, my first question is uh, about the patient volume selection tool. These two present the images to the user and that user makes the selection, right? Yep. Uh, in, in your opinion, what are the challenges for those who want to develop an automatic, uh, automatic uh, patient volume selection tool? Okay, so I was typing here, sorry for my delay, but uh, the main idea of developing a patient volume selection tool is to help the, the doctors to select the best scans because it's not always as straightforward as we think. Uh, there are different kinds of artifacts that can influence in the image you're seeing. So motions like swallowing or moving the head. Uh, and the idea here is when you perform a, a patient volume selection, you try to avoid, uh, for instance, you try to normalize or perform a kind of contrast enhancement that allows you because contrast is not always uh, a property of a good or bad scan because you can always enhance 
And also uh, in the medical field, it's very hard sometimes to find data sets that provides you MRIs. So sometimes you need to convert uh, different uh, file format. So this was one of my challenges, and I think that's going to be the challenge for other people. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, in fact, it is a, 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 a the selection of the the best image. It's a difficult problem by itself. It's a, a, a topic of research by itself, right? Uh, uh, but that's why I, I made that question. Uh, in um, I have another one uh, that okay. usually in the paper we describe the final solution. The one that worked, you know, uh, but mm -hmm. you and your colleagues probably tried uh, other approaches during the research, such as choosing other techniques for feature extraction and clustering and so on. Um, uh, and we, we can get a lot of knowledge from the trials that have not been successful. Uh, so uh, have you tried other features and clustering techniques? Uh, if so, would you like to comment on the lessons learned? from them oh perfect uh i try uh when i was performing my feature selection feature selection approach uh i always try to identify the best shape descriptor and there are shape descriptors that are targeted to 2d images and also 3d images but because we are dealing with the brain is not uh correct perform a shape uh feature like shape feature extraction in different slices so it's better if we perform in the mm -hmm. entire volume so uh for alzheimer's not always the scale of the brain is important although we already know that the brain can uh, reduce can shrink while the ad is progressing because you have a, a neurodegenerative part in the gray matter like the cortex so our idea we perform the hitch kernel signature not the the scale invariance i put in the paper but when i perform i start to getting uh wrong results because the shape like the scale was important so that's why i decide to perform a uh, scale invariance in my mm -hmm. technique and also, uh, you are able to not perform k-means at the end of your work, because if you think that we can uh, get the the H kernel signature uh, for each patient, and then we can calculate the bins, the bins of each one. So we are gonna have like the we are gonna put values. We don't need to use uh, k-means to say the clusters we can perform a range so we can perform like from 0 to 10 we say this is the cluster 1 from 0 from 10 to 20 this is cluster 2 and then we perform the histogram this is all so very important uh another thing that is in the end of my work is about the similarity how can i infer if one patient is different from the other one so in our work, we perform the covariance, but the covariance uh, can be changed. You can because covariance is a kind of uh, which uh, you have you get higher covariance if the patients are very similar, and also in the, the other way around is possible. So if the patients are very different, you can get a low covariance. But I also tried the chi square test, so I perform a scalings and uh different mathematical operations and when i was trying i wasn't getting the expected results and how do i know the expected results because in the literature uh there are works that state which regions are more affected in different stages of alzheimer's so I use this information in the literature to kind of match my work. And the best, uh, the best similarity function I found was the covariance in my case. Okay, thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Um, 
Well, I don't have more questions, and uh, the audience, uh, I believe that they don't didn't have the opportunity to send the questions yet, because the due to the delay on the video. And uh, so, please uh, 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 keep following uh, what they will send you uh, via the Wuva app. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you okay. for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, and that concludes the technical session number five. Thank you all for attending it and have a good day and a great CBGRAP.